Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mir Talk. My name is Kaeza Fern, and I'm the Director of Communications at Mir. We are so glad to be getting together for another Mir Talk. Today, we will be hearing from our guest speaker, Margaret Klein Solomon. Then we'll have a question and discussion period from people from the wider Mir community. And after that, we'll open it up for questions from you in our audience. Before we begin, I just want to update you a little bit about Mir. You might have seen our recent newsletter that we are experimenting with floating mirror designs. This type of design really could serve to be a very important um, one for conserving water in reservoirs, lakes, and other water bodies. If you would like to contribute toward our efforts, we really appreciate every donation. You can go to mirror.org forward slash donate, and we thank you for your contributions. You could also write to community at mirror.org to be in touch. All right, I would like to introduce Margaret Klein-Solomon. Margaret Klein-Solomon, PhD, is a clinical psychologist turned climate activist, founding principal of Climate Awakening and current executive director of Climate Emergency Fund. She is the author of Facing Climate Emergency, How to Transform Yourself with Climate Truth, a radical self-help guide for the climate emergency. If anybody has any questions that come up while Margaret is presenting, please send those to co-host Peter in the chat. Okay, Margaret, we're so glad that you've joined us today and we're interested to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you so much for having me and uh, thanks to everyone for uh, coming and your interest. Um, so, as a clinical psychologist who's become a climate activist, I think that offering insight into this, uh, some might say softer side of the climate emergency rather than the, the hard science um, or uh, economics or policy discussions around it is really critical and um, not something we talk about nearly enough. Um, so, my overall diagnosis of the situation that we're in right now is it's a delusion, a collective delusion of normalcy, right? A, a mass delusion um, that the vast majority of people in this country and where are still living in, um, even though there's an increasing cognitive dissonance so that people are living their lives as normal even though that they increasing, increasingly realize that there is in fact an emergency. And the kind of the goal of my activism and what I've been working on for the past 10 years is to try to move uh, individuals and then hopefully society as a whole and hopefully the world as a whole into emergency mode, which means... Um, Treat, uh, it means treating the crisis as what it is, giving it the appropriate degree of resources, focus, uh, investment, discussion, that what we're doing currently is is anything but. We're, we're not even any close to treating the climate like the emergency that it is. So... This cognitive dissonance that I mentioned between what people are increasingly realizing and uh, how they actually live their life or even what they talk about, I believe that the missing key here is emotions. Um, that until we experience an emergency as something real that is happening to us and not just some kind of um, conceptual uh, scientific issue that we will not enter emergency mode and we will continue in the mass delusion. So um, I wrote this book, uh, Facing the Climate Emergency, How to Transform Yourself with Climate Truth, 
that attempts to bring people through this um, process. Uh, it, the, the goal is to guide the reader through not just reckoning with the climate emergency intellectually, but emotionally and as a whole person. So I the there's five steps in the book that I'd like to briefly um, go through before focusing in on step two, which is welcome your fear, grief, and other painful feelings. So step one in the book is face climate truth. And that means understanding the scale and scope and urgency of what's happening in the climate. And, and that means also understanding that there are layers of euphemism in terms of how the climate emergency is discussed. Um, and that's because of obviously the fossil fuel companies, but also the media's reticence to talk realistically. And even um, within the climate movement, even within climate organizations, um, there is a even, I would say dominant strand, even still that says, um, we can't we can't scare people. We have to kind of shrink down what we say to a manageable size, or else, um, yeah, we'll we'll lose people. They'll they'll panic. So um, so realizing that these layers of euphemism have been, um, I mean, basically that you've been lied to, and um, that the to quote David Wallace Wells, it's worse, much worse than you think. Uh, for just one example of how this euphemism just kind of gets thrown around um, is a lot of people talk about the climate emergency as a problem for our grandchildren. Um, whereas I, I mean, I very much think of the climate emergency as a threat, a personal threat to my safety and well-being, um, and those of people both uh, younger and older than me. This is very much not a future problem, though it, you know, it gets worse every day. Okay, so face the truth of the climate emergency, which it, in the biggest picture is um, drought will cause crop failure, which will cause uh, destabilization of uh, re regions and countries, mass migration, and state failure and chaos. That I mean, there's plenty of other things that the climate is affecting as well, but that is the, uh, let's say, fastest way to collapse, and it's exactly what happened in Syria. Um, so yeah, that's step one: face the truth. Step two is to welcome your emotions. I'm gonna go into this much more, um, but to use self-compassion and curiosity not to judgment um in there in recognizing that this is an incredibly horrible situation and that's going to result in painful feelings there's nothing wrong with you for feeling well whatever it is but you know despair grief terror rage guilt anything um so Step three is to rethink your life story. That once you've faced reality and allowed yourself to, again, not just intellectualize about what's happening, but to actually go through the emotional processes, such as grief, that show us that it's real, that it, that it calls into question everything. Why, why am I here? What are my, what are my goals for my life? How does one be a good person? Uh, what, what will my future hold? I mean, these kind of basic questions are all um, kind of up for grabs given this incredible, epic, historical moment um, that we live in. I challenge readers to think 
what if it's not random that you're born in this time of tremendous consequence? Maybe there's something actually that you're here to do, something that only you can contribute to the climate movement. Step four is to enter emergency mode, as I discussed at the beginning. And this means to, to realize that your life is in danger, that everything you love is in danger, and to act accordingly um, in terms of your time, your focus, your resources, everything. Um, and then finally, step five is to join the disruptive climate movement, uh, which means, I, I mean, the activists that are shaking us awake out of this collective delusion, and they're doing so by uh, throwing soup on paintings or blocking roads or um, disrupting sporting events or political speeches or anything. And the reason that I think that's so critical um, is because as I as I've said, I we're we're uh, sleepwalking a cliff, and the activists are shaking us awake. And while no one likes to be shaken awake, um, we have to recognize that it's um, far better than uh, than them not doing that. So at at my job, Climate Emergency Fund, we raise money for grants to disruptive climate activists and i've come i've come to believe that it is the single most effective type of activism um and i talk about it, it doesn't mean that you personally have to partake in nonviolent civil disobedience and get arrested and all of that i mean i think people should consider it but there's many 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 ways to support this part of the movement um, like fundraising or um, jail support, you know, meeting activists when they do come out of jail or providing childcare or cooking for activists or doing their books or, you know, there it really is a, a lot of different possibilities. So I wanted to lay out those five steps of the book so that we can see this conversation, which is about climate emotions and psychology, that it's not about um, feeling good or or even just like being healthy, right? There's a, a political purpose here. And it's, I mean, it's the, the personal and political become very much enmeshed. Um, but my purpose anyway in in writing the book and doing talks like this and um sharing my knowledge about psychology is to unlock the political potential the activist potential that i think uh people are carrying around but not um not activating okay so now let's talk about feeling your feelings, welcoming your feelings. Like I said, this is step two of the book. And I think in many ways it's the the most important one or, or yeah, the one that I can add the most to with clinical psychology knowledge. Um, so first, in a general sense, one of the keys to clinical psychology, you know, to talk therapy um, and to, to other um, healing practices, but is an understanding that feeling painful feelings and talking about them makes you better, makes you healthier. It's, it feels, it's in some ways feels like a paradox because there's something intuitive about the idea that you know, we should try to avoid painful feelings, but it's, it's wrong. We need to um, really, I mean, well, welcome them and even seek them out in some cases, if we feel like 
they're they're missing that where where are they where is my grief um that uh, in understanding that humans are highly emotional we all are it's a core part of our um thinking and doing processes um and that yeah it's a, a way of relating to your emotions non-judgmentally with self-compassion and an understanding that they are always changing um and, and we don't have to be afraid of them that's where so much psychological uh, mental illness comes from or psychological symptoms comes from tr being freaked out by certain feelings or thoughts that we're having and trying to um, put them out of our minds somehow. And so this is, so this is what I'm talking about is with anything, right? With um, relationships, with um, uh, whatever, any kind of existential angst with, uh, I mean, with your career, really with anything that the way to health is to welcome and process your feelings non-judgmentally. Um, one great way to think about self-compassion is that it's treating yourself the way that you would treat a beloved friend. So there's a tendency, we have such a tendency to be self-critical where uh, it's really not productive or helpful, especially when trying to open up and explore these um, different feelings. So with that, um, with that approach, with that understanding of difficult feelings, then we can turn our attention to painful climate feelings in particular, which there's many of them, but I'm going to focus on three fear, grief, and alienation. So I've spoken about fear a little bit already and that um, within the climate movement, there is something of a fear of fear. And uh, I really, I, I feel very strongly that fear is part, I mean, fear, even terror, right? A huge, huge fear is part of a rational, healthy, appropriate response to the climate emergency and that attempts to manage or limit people's fear or other emotions are deeply misguided. And, you know, one thing you hear in the climate movement is that fear doesn't work as a motivator, which is, I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Fear is one of the core motivators for humans and other species. I mean, it, fear is literally how we translate uh, the perception of a risk, of a danger, into self-protective ac action. So, I mean, speaking personally, I, I feel just about constant fear. Um, yeah, it's it's always with me. Um, it's it's why I work so hard at climate activism because that is the only thing that I have found that to, that can contain that fear and put it to productive use. Um, I'm afraid for myself um, and particularly um, the people that I love, like my uh, young niece and nephew. Um, the, the idea of, um, the idea of them, what, what they have to face at such a young age. I, yeah, I mean, it's just absolutely terrifying. Um, the novel Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler paints a, uh, terrifying and vivid portrayal of uh, the 2020s in a par partially collapsed United States. Um, I highly recommend it. If you if you don't, feel, I, I, my guess is the people on this call feel pretty afraid, which is appropriate. Um, 
but uh, if you need some help imagining the future and understanding how scary it is i think reading that book or other i don't know about uh, yeah let, let's just stick with that book um for a realistic but terrifying portrayal okay so grief grief is a normal and healthy human process it is the way that we respond to loss that allows us to recognize how important it is to us and to adapt to new realities. If people don't go through a grieving process for whatever reason, and now I mean, I'm talking about like when losing a loved one or something like that, if people don't go through a normal, healthy grieving process, it, it is um, incredibly detrimental to their um, mental health. It, it's, um, they get stuck, whereas grief allows you to process and move forward. Um, there's so much to grieve with climate. There's the losses that have happened already. And there's also, uh grief for the future that you thought you had i think this is really important um that i mean i was just speaking personally when i was growing up i was kind of promised the world uh you know there's going to be progress political progress scientific progress um and you know i i i could uh be whatever I wanted, choose my career, choose my life, right? That was what the adults in my life were telling me. And I had a, I had a vision of what I wanted to do. And it was to be a clinical psychologist and to have a family and to write books and um, sounded great. But with facing the climate emergency, you have to realize that whatever your um, hopes and dreams and plans are for the future, that they're, they're not going to happen, um, or at least not for very long, um, that we, we live in a time of uh, accelerating climate change and um, yeah, that it will become the dominant theme of all of our lives. And that in itself, to, to grieve um, those hopes and dreams and that identity as well is, is very important. Um, of course, there's also a more generalized grief for our species or for uh, other species, for ecosystems. Um, The idea, it's important to keep in mind with grief that, and with all of these feelings, but but that it comes from the best parts of ourselves. We grieve the victims of climate change and the migrants who have been immiserated by climate change. We grieve them because they matter to us. And we grieve our future and the future that we thought humanity had because that matters to us. And so to remember that these feelings, these painful feelings, they come from that sense of connection. And that's not something that we want to, to get rid of. That's, that's something really that we should cherish. Um, finally, I'm going to talk about alienation. Um, it's quite remarkable. I've had so many conversations with people over the years about their climate feelings. In fact, that is uh, my signature question, you could say, is 
how do you feel about the climate emergency? And people say, um, <laughs> well, they say, wow, no one ever asked me that. How do I feel about it? Hmm. Which is to me uh, on its own, just remarkable. Like that even people, even climate activists, even people who work in climate change fields say, hmm, I've never thought about this emotionally. And it's like, I mean, yeah, coming from a psychological perspective, it's uh, really something, um, really important gap to fill. But once people do start talking and sharing their emotional experience, the most common thing, the single most common thing that I hear is I feel so alone. No one understands. My family doesn't understand. My friends don't understand. I, um, yeah, I feel, I feel alienated from other people. And that is, this is also a uh, very understandable. I feel it. Um, absolutely. Uh, I live here in Brooklyn walking, um, uh, around my neighborhood and I see people, hey, whatever, uh, just living, going, going about their days. Um, so, you know, sometimes specific actions like cars idling or something really makes me angry, but just, just people with their kind of everyday activities, I feel, feel very different from them. Um, one metaphor, I guess, that I, I like for this is, um, it feels like I'm at a funeral, but no one else knows that it's a funeral. Um, and so the experience of feeling alone with your understanding of the climate emergency and so different and alienated from other people is profoundly painful. And it's also, I think, uniquely important in the sense that it's the one thing that we can actually solve, right? No matter, even, even, if, um, even if activists are extremely successful um, and we move into emergency mode, there's still going to be grief. There's still going to be fear. There's still going to be many painful feelings, but no one has to be alone with them. And so the sense of alienation that people feel is actually quite, I mean, not easily, but it's, it's very solvable. And that is through talking about your feelings. Um, there's different venues for this as well as you know just through your social relationships but there's climate grief circles and um in my program climate awakening it's a uh, opportunity for people to get together in small groups with strangers and from all over the world and participants watch a series of videos short videos um in which I explain some kind of concept like don't judge your emotions, use self-compassion, et cetera. And then they answer prompts in their small group, particularly, how do you feel about the climate emergency? And everyone has three minutes to share their feelings. In a sense, it's very simple, right? It's uh, so simple it could be automated through this kind of um, online platform, the facilitation can be automated. But it's incredibly powerful because people say, I don't, I don't have anyone I can talk to about this. Or, you know, to, to hear people from different states or different countries expressing very similar things, but of course also unique personal experiences with the climate emergency leaves people with a profound sense of connectedness. Um, and, you know, it's the opposite of alienation. So I strongly encourage people to take part in those kinds of emotional climate conversations, structured climate conversations, as well as unstructured ones to, to you know, to try to talk with your friends and family 
about the climate emergency and particularly from an emotional perspective. This is how I'm doing with it. Um, and you know, one thing that you'll find is that you're not as alone as you think, uh, that more and more people are waking up and in a recent Lancet survey of global young people, 54% uh, said that humanity is doomed and 45% said that climate anxiety affects them every day. So, you know, that's young people, but it, it, you're not alone. And the silence, what Yale Climate Communications Program calls the spiral of silence around the climate, which means no one talks about it because no one talks about it. It, uh, it can be, we can break that. We can uh, reverse that spiral and create, um, create a collective awakening. R rather than this mass delusion, we can, through feeling the, the weight and the impact of the climate emergency, and sharing those feelings with each other, that that is the way to creating, uh, to, to collectively entering emergency mode. Like, I mean, just for example, when this happens, when, when this kind of emotional process really gets going, I, I mean, people, sh people should be crying in public, right? Newscasters should be crying as they you know deliver this news um you know families and it should have emergency meetings where they discuss and what are, what are we going to do um both on a personal level but also on a political level how are we going to respond that that kind of response yeah can only come when we stop running away from fear and we yeah, wel welcome these feelings because they, they, they have a message for us, and we need to we need to listen to them. We need to process them, and we need to share them with other people. Um. So, yeah, uh, I will take questions. Thank you so much, Margaret. Yeah, I think it's really. I think pointing out the alienation is so important because that's something that is not talked about um, as much as I think it, it could could be or should be. Um, we would like to bring on a couple of people from the Mirror community next who will just ask some questions. And just a reminder to everybody in our audience, you can send your questions for after that to Peter, co-host in the chat. All right, so first we're going to bring on the deputy director of MIR, who's Barbara Sneath. Barbara Sneath, PhD, coordinates all nonprofit functions through MIR's fiscal sponsor, Social Environmental Entrepreneurs, and serves on the MIR core leadership team. A former biological research scientist and educator at Cornell University, she is now a passionate climate activist having been aware of humanity's destabilization of the biosphere since childhood. All right, Barbara, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, Margaret, for writing the book, which I did enjoy reading. I sort of wished that I had known about it and I became absolutely terrified and climate aware, but I seem to have survived that experience. And now, as you are, I'm really working hard and doing everything that I can to um, be a climate activist and to change the tra trajectory of humanity and the entire biosphere. So um, I was wondering if you could take maybe a couple of questions from me. I've got some, but um, the first one is that um, being a psychologist, you probably have good insight into how parents and grandparents can convey the terrifying state of the world. I mean, it's terrifying for grown-ups, but how to convey that in an age-appropriate way to their children and grandchildren. 
Thank you. This is a very difficult question. I don't have children, so it's I feel it is not my area of expertise. I do have a few things to say, but I also want to recommend um, Anya Kamenetz's work and Harriet Sugarman's work, who are, this is their focus area. Um, but basically, and this is drawn from also how to talk to children about other difficult topics, such as death of a loved one. Um, you should be honest. That doesn't mean necessarily, um, I don't, I mean, honestly, I don't know how honest to be. Do you talk about the collapse of civilization <laughs> or is it just, um, uh, oh, you know, we're, we're warming the earth. It's really bad. It's dangerous. I, I'm not sure, but you try to be honest in, in age appropriate way, right? It's different to talk to a teenager about this than a four-year-old. Um, and the most important message that you have to convey to children, and it needs to be honest, but is I'm doing everything that I can. And we, you and I can do everything that we can together to try and try and stop this. Uh, you know, Mr. Mr. Rogers talked about look for the helpers, right? That there's, there are people, many people and growing who are trying to help. And, and again, we are on that team and yeah, I, I think that without that, children can and should feel betrayed by their the adults in their lives. Um, yeah. Thank you. And my second question is to do with how we can grow from a relatively small community of climate activists, activists into a mainstream um, movement where everybody agrees that we must work together in an emergency mode that is going to be a marathon, not a sprint, and that people will have to change their lifestyles and be willing to perhaps sacrifice certain things. And as you said, give up futures that many had assumed would just happen <laughs> because of the current climate emergency and thank you for your work in forming the climate emergency fund and um, funding those activists that have managed to change the conversation and bring the media's attention to this unfortunately it seems that only rather um i guess flamboyant actions get people's get, get the note the noti notice of the mainstream media and people in general. Um, okay, so working backwards, yes, that's exactly right, that only these um, flamboyant actions get media attention. Um, for example, uh, one of the groups that Climate Emergency Fund supports is Just Stop Oil in the United Kingdom. Um, that is the group that started the uh they threw uh tomato soup on van gogh's sunflowers and you know this was incredibly controversial and covered everywhere i mean truly billions of media impressions from that action but it, you know the coverage was so negative people are you know this is just ridiculous <laughs> and one of the criticisms people said is why don't they target the fossil fuel infrastructure and this is a very frustrating and telling critique to me because that group just stop oil just six months before had been arrested hundreds of times targeting the fossil fuel infrastructure in the united kingdom they occupied uh refineries and uh export terminals i mean they they cut off petrol supplies to whole regions of the United Kingdom. And who's heard about that, right? It's so the, the media ecosystem is so broken that it 
it is pushing the activists. It's demanding that the activists take these um, kind of spectacular tactics. If the media was doing their job, they would be, it would be headlines on climate every day. And then, and they would be reporting on climate activists, you know, going door to door and, you know, doing or, or protesting fossil fuel infrastructure and whatnot, but, but they don't, they, they, it's not news to them. So I think it's, I think that's really important um, to keep in mind, both in terms of evaluating a movement's strategy, but also, I mean, I just, it's a personal frustration of mine, how quickly people are to condemn climate activists for their tactics, which, you know, to me, these are like the bravest people I know. And it's, yeah, I just uh, get very frustrated by that. But okay, so how do we get into the mainstream? So I think, I mean, we have to remember the sad fact that the climate emergency is only getting worse. It's getting worse every day. And I'm seeing in my own life, people who have been, let's say, I don't know, ignoring it, like, yeah, in this dissonance, recognizing that it's there, but, you know, minimizing or whatnot are, are taking a more serious attitude, which, you know, is look out your window, right? Has this been a normal summer for anyone? Um, where where on earth are people experiencing the same uh, climate conditions and weather patterns that they're used to? Um, here in New York, it's a, we're like a it's a it's like a tropical climate now, and not just the heat, but the rain, the pouring rain that then um, leaves quickly in and now it's sunny again. The only place I've seen that kind of climate was the rainforest. Um, so, so it's up to the movement to capture this energy, which is there. It is. People are alarmed and increasingly so. So I think, I mean, it's, it's the big question, right? It is, it is the critical question. How do we grow into truly a mass movement? Um, and I mean, there's, I think there's many parts of that. It's a social movement ecosystem. I personally am focused. And I mean, I think there's good reason to, to do this, but on the, the real tip of the spear, um, what sometimes social scientists call the radical flank and the radical flank effect is that it raises awareness and raises participation in the movement as a whole Many people see Just Stop Oil or other disruptive groups and say, wow, I really don't like those tactics, but I do have to do something, right? So um, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I mean, it's, I guess I'll say, I'll, I'll uh, say it's the right question. It's the question that I think we should all be like obsessed with. <laughs> How do we create a mass climate movement that, that tells the truth um, and, and demands um, action on the scale of the emergency. Thank you, Margaret. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Next, we're going to bring on Lisa Bjurka. Lisa Bjurka is a human ecologist with 10 years of experience in sustainability and climate activism planning and implementation in higher education. Thanks for being with us, Lisa. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. Thank you for speaking clearly. And um, yeah, and all for all you do with the fund um, and like really enabling the radical flank effect. And my question is for the people, for the majority of us, we're not in a radical flank, but you are opening up space for us. If you have advices or suggestion of what to do with that opening and how to sustain ourselves. And it's going to come down to like, how do we deal with disappointments? 
uh, that is ongoing with that grief. I think a lot of us have gone through the good good grief network and all those other resources that exist there. But and then the urgency that can lead to like a panic attack. And like as you know, you can only sustain in panic mode for like half an hour and then you're physically are exhausted. So like the difference between like the the emotions and then the feelings. So my main question is for us who are not in the sphere but in that open space, um, how do we support each other and how do we like allow these feelings in and what are some of the devices you have for us there? Thank you. Um, so one thing um, is to set up structured discussions about climate emotions. You mentioned the Good Grief Network, they're terrific. But anyone, any organization or campaign or group that's working on climate really should take the time to hear from everyone about how they're feeling. It's incredibly powerful. Um, and it also builds uh, group cohesion and empathy. So, yeah, and it's and it's really it's not that hard. It's not you know it's it's not rocket science. It's just um, all you need is a emotional safety, right? Which means no one is going to be no one will criticize or even disagree with anyone's emotional expression. Your job is to express your own feelings, and if you want, you can say I resonated with what this person said, um, but. So if you have an atmosphere of emotional safety, then it's just uh, take turns sharing, um, keep it in the feelings realm. You know, we can tend to go uh, sneak into intellectual, you know, start talking about uh, solar panels or, uh, you know, this policy or that policy, um, but, you know, to bring it back to feelings um, and just give everyone a turn. Um, I think. I think that uh, understanding our limits is also important. Um, you know, in the military, even during wartime, there's ne a need for rest and relaxation, R and R. Everybody gets that. It's not. It's not a weakness. It's not um, laziness. It's a normal part of maintaining healthy functioning and, you know, productive, effective activism. So I think recognizing that for ourselves and for our uh, comrades is, is really important. Um, for, so, so for, for me, and I, I mean, I guess generally speaking, I think it's important to find things, recreation or things to do that are diverting without denial, right? So for example, I, I have two dogs and when I, when I spend time with them, you know, we don't talk about the climate emergency, right? But it's not, but it's not, um, you know, pretending that everything is fine. Like, I, yeah, I, I am kind of allergic to artifice and um, yeah, having just having conversation, social conversations or whatever, where it feels like we are pretending that things are normal is not, let's say, restorative for me, but doing something like, you know, uh, taking care, I mean, taking care of your physical body I think is really important and it, and it has this benefit of not needing to deny reality. You know, when you take a run or work out or whatever, it's, yeah, you're just, your, fo your focus is different. Um, yeah. Ch so changing your focus rather than utilizing defenses of denial, basically. Um, yeah. And then, and then I, I think just, in general, self-compassion, that recognizing that this is very hard work and it's 
you know, but that we're doing our best. I have a follow-up question, but I don't know, uh, can you say, is that allowed? Yeah, or? that's fine. Sure. Okay, okay. Thank you. That was really helpful. Um, I'm, and I'm sitting here thinking also about, you talked about the questioning your story, like our own stories, and how do we help others questioning their stories? Um, what are some helpful like psychological methods here? And then how do you move from there from resentment, which I think a lot of us, at least I feel towards myself off, off, often, and then towards compassion. What are some helpful tools to give others when they're changing their story, they're going to be feeling some resentment towards their old story or how they're not acting. So like, how do you change your story and help others? And then how do you go from resentment to compassion? Um, okay. So to the first one, I think a, a very, very helpful and impactful thing that we can do for each other and for for other people is helping them think about their strengths and what they in particular can bring to this movement. So I, choosing what to do in the climate movement is about as complex and personal as choosing a career, right? It involves the intersection of, you know, who am I? What am I good at? What do I like to do? As well as looking at the external reality, what's what's available, what what works, et cetera. So I, I mean, I, and I try to do this in the book, help people kind of take an inventory. What do I have to offer, et cetera? And try to think where that can fit in. So if you are able to offer that kind of, I mean, really mentorship about um, helping people think through their own assets and resources and combine that with the knowledge of the movement. I mean, it's really, like we're like coaching. Um, it's really incredibly, incredibly important because people say, I mean, you hear it all the time, but what can I do, right? So helping people really take that question seriously because everyone can do something um so and then in terms of self let's say self judgment to self compassion um yeah i mean the idea of how would you treat a beloved friend i think is really important like and to, so to really challenge yourself with that uh, you know, if you're whatever, whatever you're, uh, you know, criticizing yourself for, imagine it was your best friend or your sibling or whoever that was uh, confiding in you these feelings. And yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's really a remarkable thing how, <laughs> how poorly we treat ourselves um, compared to uh, people that we love. So I think that can be I think that can be really helpful. Um, and and just no one asked to be born into this horrible situation. And none of us caused it. It's so much bigger than us. You know, it's been mounting for hundreds of years. Um, so that kind of a, a recognition that um, like here we are. Uh, and so trying to view it as, let's say, a call to greatness rather than a uh, litany of personal failings. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think... Sometimes I feel that judgment towards my family and close friends too. And I need to like work on that. I want to extend the, <laughs> find the compassion for them. Um, yeah. Yep. But also for yourself, because it's, that's a normal way to feel. That's understandable. I feel that way too. You know, like it's, we're, we're in it, we're in a really nightmarish situation. So the idea, you know, so yeah, things are messy. Feelings are messy. Relationships are messy. You know, that's not surprising. Thank you.
Thanks, Lisa. All right, well, we are going to open it up to some questions from our audience. We have a question that's come in from Martina, who uh, is referring to Parable of the Sower. And says, one thing that stood out to me is that the characters didn't seem to process their emotions on their faces in such a horrific situation. So how do we navigate this dilemma? Do we compartmentalize the processing of emotions to keep agency? And I think, you know, it's an interesting point that sometimes our emotions just, as you said, everyone has emotions and sometimes they're, you know, larger. <laughs> sometimes they kind of take over. Um, and so, you know, how do we navigate that? So in the, in the book, um, conditions have gotten so bad that people are pretty focused on their own short-term needs and survival. Um, dealing with you know, food insecurity and homelessness and um, violence. And so I think that in, it's a different kind of emergency mode that people go into in those situations that is very focused um, and yeah, that that in contrast, many of us, not all, not all of us, certainly, but many of us now still have the safety and security and you know, regular food and other necessities in order to do this work, to feel these feelings and to process them and to do, to, to do what we can for uh to protect all of us um and so i i mean to me that's kind of part of the part of the urgency is that we don't have that long i don't know exactly how long but we don't have that long um to be able to do activism and to to focus on changing the world before our concerns become almost entirely practical um and uh you know yeah so yeah people have different ways of expressing feelings some people feel very comfortable crying talking about feelings um for some people it's much harder uh for some people they can talk about certain feelings but not others um and just pushing ourselves towards um greater openness with that um seeing be, being curious um about our inner experience um, rather than judgmental, I, I think is the way. Mm -hmm. Well, this is kind of, this is a, this is a question from somebody else, but it's a little bit of a follow-up from that, um, from LD. It's hard for me to trust people I've just met and speak openly about my grief in a public setting. Um, that's something, you know, that makes me feel uncomfortable. How might I cultivate cultivate the self compassion that you're suggesting? So, you know, do you have any practices or something that you, you know, like specific practices that you recommend for that? There's a really good book called Self Compassion by Kristen Neff. Um, so I highly recommend that. She has recommendations like self compassion meditation. Um. I, for me, it's really been about psychotherapy. And I do think that if you can get into psychotherapy, it is excellent. Um, you, I mean, knowing that climate change is one of the main things that you're going to want to talk about, or I mean, 
everyone ever, you know, there's plenty to talk about, but that that's going to be a major issue. It's a good idea to talk to potential therapists about that up front. Um, because the last thing you need is a therapist telling you that you're, you know, overreacting and um, neurotic for, you know, your, your feelings about this. Though I do think the profession has, has um, made serious strides on that. Um, but so what's so magical about psychotherapy or one of the really core things is when you share, you know, your deepest, darkest thoughts and feelings and secrets with someone else who then still accepts you um, and does not judge you that that's, a, you know, just such a healing experience, um, a demonstration of compassion and which, which most of us have not had. Um, so another practice, um, that I recommend is writing about your feelings, like journaling. Um, I, I, it's, um, I think talking to other people is better, but like you said, it can be challenging. It can be um, stressful and it can go wrong. Um, so, but so writing about your feelings is a good um, way to articulate them um, just to yourself. So to, uh, I, I, I recommend this to everyone to write down three feelings that you have about the climate emergency and that means emo emotion words you know terror guilt shame whatever um and then and trying to elaborate them in in writing um you know i feel this i feel that i feel this um so yeah and not sorry for the self promotion but i do think that um facing the climate emergency uh can help people can help, can help you. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, reading is in a way a solitary act, but it's also you know, like a conversation with, with me. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay. Well, here's a question from Martin. As both activists and non-activists, we're all trapped in our capitalist way of life. How can we discuss the climate emergency with our family without getting into an argument? You know, you said just a minute ago that sometimes it's, you know, it's easier to discuss things and sometimes it's really hard. Yeah, I've definitely had arguments um, about climate with both friends and family. Um, and this, yeah, I mean, so I, there's no guarantees, right? If you decide to bring this up or any, any topic up with your family, there might be an argument. Um, but I think that focusing on emotions, your emotions, is actually a very good way to make it less likely because if you say, um, this is what's happening and this is what we need to do about it, which is, which is fine. I mean, I like, yeah, I have no problem with that way of communicating either, but that, but it's, if you do that, then people can disagree, right? They can say, but what about this? What about that? What about, you know, climate denier talking points or political concerns, whatever, whatever it is. But if you say, I've been struggling so much worrying about my future. I just see, you know, the darkness closing in, um, you, you know, and just talk about it and say, and how are you doing with it? How are you feeling? That it's, um, it's harder to argue. And I, I mean, you certainly, you certainly can, but it's much harder to argue with someone's expression of their own own experience rather than a um like an objective truth claim so and it, and it can be disarming for for people um 
to to hear that kind of authentic sharing. So I yeah, I um I think I would say that. I would say, I mean, you know, it depends, <laughs> it depends who your family is, but um I have some like straight up climate denying, Trump supporting relatives. And um one thing, I mean, one thing that I keep in mind and that I've said to them, but just that that I keep in mind is, you know, I really wish that they were right. That what we share is a, a desire, a hope that the climate change isn't happening. Um, and so in that way, you can you can join them, you know, you can share with them um, in that desire while still, you know, recognizing that it's, you know, the, tr the truth is what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, that's really good advice that you give. Um, okay, well, we have a couple more questions. Andrea is asking, I'd like to know what can we do about the fact that the climate movement is actually losing support in society because of disruptive activists like last generation? Is there a danger of losing society's support for the cause due to these extreme activists groups rather than gaining from this form of activism, you know, activism that is, yeah, healthier? Yeah, thank you. This is a super common question and concern um, that people have about disruptive activism. And I I don't share it. Um, it is definitely true that these activists are very unpopular. That is true. But it's important to remember that social movements are just in, pretty inherently unpopular in that they are a small group of people telling a much larger group of people that they need to change. Um, and yeah, I mean, Martin Luther King was never popular during his lifetime. His approval rating was always under 50%. Um, that, and, and most importantly, that it's not a popularity contest in the sense that the goal is not that people like the climate activists or, or uh, you know, think that they're brave and, you know, worth supporting. I mean, yeah, that can be a goal, but that is not the, the goal. The goal is to get everyone thinking all the time about the climate and to have it be constantly in the headlines and have tremendous pressure on politicians. So for example, when someone goes to vote, they're not choosing whether or not to support a climate activist. They're choosing, the, the, the relevant question is how much weight are they giving and when they choose their candidate how much weight are they putting on the climate? Because one thing we need is to make climate change the number one voting issue in every election. So, yeah, so it's just important to realize that the activists can succeed and I believe are succeeding, even if everyone hates them um, or eh, whatever, 80% of people do. So um, yeah, one thing you, you'll hear a lot is, um, like uh, this is just back to just stop oil, but it's it's very similar. But is um, well, I agree that we shouldn't have any new fossil fuel production, but I don't agree with your methods. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's just let's just pause here and focus on the first half of that sentence. You agree that there shouldn't be any new fossil fuel production? Like that's I mean that's amazing. Um, so yeah, to, to just bear in mind that, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's okay. Um, and it's honestly, it's one, one way 
in which the activists are very, very brave. Um, and, and that it's an ecosystem. The movement is an ecosystem. And that means that, or there's an organization now in the United Kingdom called uh, Climate Majority Project that's trying to fill this niche. And their um, Rupert Reed is highly involved. And the idea is um, to tell the truth about the climate emergency and the scope of what actually needs to change, but not have disruptive tactics. You know, so for people who are, um, you know, activated by the disruptive actions, but don't want to take part in them, that this is something that they can do. And so to, yeah, to, um, I think there's, I mean, I think there's plenty to be done in that space, right? Or organizing new people who are, want to do something, don't know what to do and don't like the disruptive activists. That is a real constituency that needs to be organized. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, two questions. I think I'll tie mine into the last one. So this question is, uh, when I spoke to an acquaintance about the climate emergency, he responded, he doesn't care because he'll be dead before the devastating effects. I'm sure you've heard this one before, Margaret. Um, do you think this reaction is a form of psychological self-protection? And how does one you know, enter into a conversation? with that yeah that's so bleak um i definitely have heard that from people um and depending i mean if if this person is you know in their 90s or something they might be right um but for many people it's not even true it's it's a it's a part of underestimating the accelerating nature of the climate emergency so that's one thing you know you can say like, are you sure <laughs> you know have you how how up to date are you on climate science that you're you're so sure that you know nothing catastrophic is going to happen during during your lifespan i mean look at look at the flooding all over the place or the fires like it this is this is killing people now so that's one thing but it's also to to just um I mean, really, I, I would say to try to sit with the person in terms of how, how dark that is, um, like, wow, so you're not bothered by the catastrophic loss of hundreds of millions or billions of people, millions of species. You're not bothered by that because you won't be there personally to see it is it, i mean like i mean so i get like curiosity really like what's going on what's what's going on with that i mean you you feel so disconnected from from your fellow human or your, you know your fellow living creature um that like I, I, and just i mean because i don't i don't believe it basically I don't, I mean, I think that that kind of apathy is a defense against, I mean, really probably against helplessness. My guess is what that person is expressing more than anything is, I have no idea what I can do. So, um, but yeah, I mean, to the, like kind of back to the theme, the themes that I've been talking about to try to be non-judgmentally curious with them about that feeling. And also, I mean, and, and, and empathy. I mean, cause I've felt something like that, right? Like, uh, that, um, you know, that, that death is an escape from, from this tragedy, you know, that, that, um, so, I mean, in some ways, that's what they're, that's in some ways, that's what they're saying, right? Like, this is so painful, I'd rather be dead. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Well, we are going to wrap it up soon, but just this last one, and I'll comment that I remember when I first really 
let myself feel like a full amount of grief. Um, and it was years ago after seeing a talk and, and the person was talking about how we respond when, you know, we get that input, we respond to something in emergency when we get that impulse, like there's a lion and it's about to eat me. I better run. And, you know, the, people talk about the brain and kind of what part of the brain is being activated when you're just in pure survival um, mode. And, you know, there's, that's, it's a, it's a rush. It's an adrenaline rush among other things, but um, this, so Jonathan asks the question and, and says, I'm in a place where summer thunderstorms were a common occurrence. When we were children, we eagerly anticipated them as exciting demonstrations of nature's strength. I think a lot of us can relate to that um, running out into the rain and the, the thrill of it. Could it be that some of what we see now as apathy about stopping weather disasters is actually this sense of thrill, like, oh, something exciting is happening? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think... Um... The, the scale of climate is so huge. It's it's everything. Uh, so our emotional reactions also will span the whole gamut. I mean, in, in, including, um, yeah, excitement at the, you know, immense power of nature, sure. And also, um, uh, like, destructive glee, right? That, that um everything's falling apart and there's something good about that because it, you know, I mean, I'm in so much internal pain that it'll at least like take my mind off it or, and everyone will be in pain like me that, I, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, so I, I, I definitely think that that's any feeling that you have or that someone else has is you know is is valid and by um trying to empathize with it th this idea um i forget which ancient greek philosopher said this but this idea that nothing human is alien to me so that even the darkest um you know most perverse expression of whatever is like we can we can, you can kind of see it, right? You you have some kind of experience that is is close to that. You can try to feel your way in. So, yeah, it, it is. I mean, yeah, on on some level, sure, this is exciting. I mean, it's like the biggest thing that's ever happened, and we get to witness it. I, it's uh, <laughs> I it's not. I'll say that's not my primary emotional reaction but it is yeah it's true yeah uh, I, I know some people feel that way about nuclear war as well that it's like wouldn't that be something you know um but uh yeah I think I yeah I just think that the the core if you leave if you leave this talk with one thing it's about um being open to the vast array of emotions particularly that you have but also that everyone has and trying to see and and just and especially in this situation of overwhelming scope to just to to recognize of course I, yeah people will be absolutely all over the place with it and even and even one person will be will feel a huge range of feelings and many of them contradictory and and it's all and the yeah the way to handle that is just to be curious and to welcome them and to not judge yourself or other people in their emotions yeah well we want to thank you so much for coming to share these five steps maybe i'll just speak them out um for everybody face the truth that you pointed out, welcome your emotions, fear, grief, and alienation, or any emotion around it. Rethink your life story, enter emergency mode, and join the disruptive climate movement.
I think it's really great that you've boiled them down, you know, to things that we can remember. Um, also, if you want to hold up your book again, we can encourage everybody to purchase Facing the Climate Emergency. Thank One you. I, yeah. I just put a link in the chat where people can either purchase it or also that you can download a free chapter, which happens to be the chapter that I've been discussing the most, the um, step to welcome your feelings. So, Excellent. Thanks for doing that. Yeah. Thank you for coming, Margaret. Thanks so much again for um, everyone uh, for coming. It's uh, its its own kind of bravery to uh, face these emotions. At Mir, we are working to help educate the public while also trying to address the heating on the planet. We invite you to keep learning about Earth's energy imbalance on our website, mirror.org. And just reminding you, we're an almost 100% volunteer staff with just a few paid people at the moment. So we want to ask you to please consider making a monthly donation of any amount if you aren't already. You can check us out on social media. And of course, there's our YouTube channel we encourage you to subscribe to. I want to let you know that next month, Sunday, September 3rd, we are going to be having a really special event. We'll be premiering our short documentary, Freetown Cooling a City, which features never before seen footage of the experiments there. And it shows the impact that Mir is having in that area. So I look forward to seeing everybody then. And thank you so much for coming.